So um, thank you um, for coming, and thanks to the Leakey Foundation for inviting me. Um, and what I want to do is I want to pose the question, end game, is Earth close to a tipping point? And it's interesting um, that Ariel just talked up uh, about talked about uh, space. This is a picture from Scott Kelly. I don't know if any of you guys used to follow his tweets, but um, early on, early on, I was just mesmerized by these these photos that he took from space because it's such a really good way to reflect on our planet and to reflect on how thin the atmosphere is how incredibly uh, obvious the human footprint is on our planet from space. And also, if you turn the other way, or you look beyond the planet, just how much vast emptiness there is. This is our home. And in spite of any of you who might want to go to Mars, this is it. This is really what we have. So I, I use this. I used to look at it every single day to remind me of really what I'm trying to do now is to, to make a difference on the planet. And speaking of that, I'll talk about this, this book. It's kind of weird to plug a book. I've never written one before. I wrote it with my husband, Tony Barnosky. And, and the, it is coming out next week. It's being distributed by Macmillan, so you should be able to find it in your local bookstore um, or on Amazon if you want to go, if you don't, if you want to go away from buying local. So what I want to do is tell you a little bit of a story. So <laughs> Uh, I, um, I, uh, I work around the world, and one of the things I spend my time doing is I try and understand how um, time and how the environment influences the ecology and evolution of vertebrates. I work mostly on mammals, but I also worked on birds and reptiles and amphibians, and we can talk about that some other time. But I want to tell you a little bit of a story about what got me here and, um, and writing a book about tipping points for planet Earth. Now, I'm going to tell you first that I study these animals called pikas. And I don't know if many of you have seen them. If you've hiked up in high elevation in the American West, the, there's a single species in the Great Basin in the American West, the uh, Okatona princeps. This one is not from North America. This is actually one of 28 species from the Himalayas, which are, are shown here, right? So there's an average elevation of about 15,000 feet. So pikas are moving up slope. They're cold adapted animals. They live in tailless slope. They have a very high, they're just really cool animals. They have a very high resting metabolism. Their body temperature is about 102 to 104. They don't hibernate, and yet they live in this really cold environment. They make these hay piles. They have these really interesting vocalizations and chirps, if you uh, are familiar with them. But what's happening in the Himalayas is that they're moving up slope because climate's warming. However, they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place because as they move up slope, they're getting higher and higher elevation. And if you've, any of you have been at 15,000 feet, there aren't too many places at 15,000 feet in the Americas, right? If you get up there, you're faced with hypoxia. So we went to understand. We're trying to understand how they're moving. Are they replacing each other? Uh, what's happening? We've done a lot with the evolution of these guys and looked at their genomes and, and how that, um, that evolution to hypoxia has actually evolved. But it took me and um, a couple of other students and an Indian colleague of mine to the high Napoleon uh, Himalayas. Uh, this is remote. Very, uh, very tough work. You basically go days uh, away from any kind of a road. There's no beast of burden. Everything you carry, you carry on your back. And what we were doing is we were hiking in the very last bits of trees in the upper Himalayas. And here's a, a nice photo of some of those mountains. These are the trees. And this is where, this is the last vestige of where the red panda lives. Now I'll tell you, these trees, are not what they're supposed to look like, right? So they're all kind of denuded from, uh, fr the branches are denuded. And in the book that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about, there's a chapter about what happened and, and when I learned what, what, what's happened to those branches. It turns out that the local people are shimming up these trees while they're still living and cutting the branches down for firewood. And that firewood is used by people like this woman and her baby. Uh, she's a teen mother. 
absolutely gorgeous, wonderful, warm. These are the kinds of people you stay with when you cl climb up these high elevation areas. She runs this little, what's called a tea house. It's uh, just kind of, there's a couple of rooms in here. This is where we eat. This is the main area, it's where she's sitting here. This is a wood stove, and this is what she uses to cook our food, okay? So these, these kids are climbing up these trees. They're cutting down the branches. They're right off the living tree, which of course is completely killing the habitat for the red panda. And then they're using this to cook our food. Uh, there's no heat in this building. However, there is this thing. Anybody know what this is? It's a little solar panel, and it's about this big, and this charges cell phones. So every one of these people, even though they're days away from even the smallest village, they're living on these knife edges by themselves, or maybe there are a couple of houses there, they all have connections to cell phones. And every day they go out and they turn this little panel to, uh, to capture the sun. So I started wondering, is this the past? Here they are living with firewood. We're just cooking over a stove. And yet, we're not all charging our cell phones with solar panels. So it was this really interesting, is this the way the future is going to be for us, or is this really a glimpse into our past? And that really started me thinking more deeply about this issue that I want to talk to you a little bit about. So the title of the talk had tipping points in it. And you can just think about tipping points as a state. You know, it's a nonlinear sta uh, non state. And in some sort of a, a dynamic system, and you could envision this kind of egg on the edge being a dynamic system, you push it just a tiny bit. You can push it for a long time off the surface and nothing happens to it. One little touch and it drops and completely changes into a new state. So there are all sorts of tipping points and we could talk about it in detail, but the point is, has Earth gotten to a point in its history beyond, beyond which it can no longer be what it used to be? It's more than just a rhetorical question. Actually, mass extinctions are tipping points. Mass extinctions are where we lose, they're just by definition where we lose over 75% of all the species on the planet. There are times during this uh, Permo-Triassic extinction event, for example, where we lost about 95% of all the species on the planet, that clearly changes the state of the planet. And importantly, it changes the state of the planet for many, many millions of years afterwards. So when I'm talking about tipping points for planet Earth, there's clearly this idea and this uh, the data suggesting we're headed for an extinction event. And yes, Earth will likely survive, but it's not ever going to be like what humans are used to. So that brings up the issue of climate. And what I want you to see here is that the scales are really funny here. So five to one million years ago, then 500,000 years ago to about 11,000 years ago, then 10 to 2,000 years, then we get into the 150 years, and then we go into the future. So this is a this is a record of temperature over the last five million years. And this is where we're headed into the future. So I'll tell you as a paleontologist, one thing we know, that by the year 2050, planetary temperatures, the average planetary temperature is going to be warmer than our species has ever experienced in its lifetime, okay? So we, you know, we think about Af out of Africa somewhere around 500,000 years ago to 200,000 years ago. I mean, there's no temperature even remotely like this in just the next few decades. By the year 2100, you can't even go back, you have to go back 14 million years to get global temperatures equivalent to where we're headed. And what that does is it takes us out of the realm of the evolutionary history of all of the species that we're familiar with on the planet's landscape. So all the mammals that we're familiar with, None of those are about are 15 million years old, 14 million years old. Now, I want you to pay attention to this part of the time scale because this is where we really come in and start dominating the landscape. In the Americas, this is when humans colonized. And if you look around uh, the planet, we left Africa somewhere between two and 100,000 years ago. We ended up in Europe, we ended up on Australia, we ended up in Asia, we kind of swung back around into to, um, 
to Europe after deglaciation. And then we crossed the Bering Land Bridge. This, when sea levels were lower, this was a massive land bridge. And we probably hung out here for a few, maybe a 10,000 years or so, and then we rapidly colonized the Americas. We made it you know, dramatically quickly all the way from the Bering uh, Land Bridge all the way down to the tip of South America. And as we went, we hunted things. So not only did climate change, but we also killed a lot of animals. This is a menagerie, this kind of bestiary of, these are the animals that used to be basically right here in North America as recently as around 10 to 12,000 years ago. About half of the world's large animals went extinct at this time period. So, you know, elephant relatives, these giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, this is the California state fossil, camels evolved in North America, we have them, some left in, in South America in terms of uh, guanacos and vicuñas, horses evolved in the Americas, they went extinct here too. So we lost these big mega, mega animals, mega herbivores and carnivores, and mostly, most likely because humans had played a pretty big role in their extinction. So we know that humans have been killing wildlife for thousands of years, and we're even better at it now. We are di the direct um, reason why mammals, in particular, are threatened. Three, uh, uh, two, sorry, 25% of all mammals are threatened immediately with extinction, and most of them from deliberate hunting. It's mostly because people are making more and more money. The rarer the rarer an animal gets, the more and more money pe people make on their parts. We're just hunting the last individual um, of, of many of these animals. So now I ask the first question here that you guys are supposed to answer on your phones. So I've just kind of given you a little story about humans and biomass of, of uh, mammals. I've told you a little bit about mammals, but if we were to kind of add up all the wild mammals, what, percent, what percentage of the, hu of the biomass of mammals on the planet do you think is from wild animals? We're here at 3%, 10%, 30%, and 60%, and the winner here is 10%. Okay, let's keep moving. So here is, um, this is actually calculated from real data. So I added up um, elephants and you know large mammals. We added up the biomass. We estimated population sizes. So this is a, these are all these circles you're going to see are relative to the real biomass. Okay, now there's another question. What percent of Earth's mammalian biomass is human? 60%, 30%, 10, and 3. Oh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's moving before our eyes, okay? All right, now. Okay, here is the relative size of human biomass to wild animal biomass. This is the real kicker. Look at our cats and dogs and cows and goats and sheep. The actual percentages, so you guys who had three and 30 were right on. Livestock and pets, our commensal animals, our domesticated animals, are 69% of the biomass on the planet. Now what does that mean? You know, 10,000 years ago, these animals didn't exist. And so if you just think about this, it means that we have an extinction debt. We are going to lose animals. And it's not just from our deliberate hunting. We have an extinction debt. There is no way the planet can support this kind of ratio. We also know that we're pretty good at just kind of transforming ecosystems. This is a, a simulation here on the left of what Long Island used to look like before we changed it. So we're pretty good at basically removing habitat for wild animals. And this is one of the big lingering reasons why uh, diversity will eventually decline. All levels of biodiversity are at risk. Okay, so the green spaces you see here are, the green dots are our reserves. So these are areas where we've actually said 
the countries are in, the, in the world have said, I'm, we're going to put these areas aside and we will protect biodiversity there. Now, it doesn't mean it really is protected because a lot of this protection takes law enforcement, which takes money, and, and we know that doesn't always work. But if you think about the diversity of the planet, this is a, a very tiny portion of, of the protected areas. And then you throw climate change in on there, and that's a problem because the world has lost corridors. The connection between these reserves means that animals that want to move, that will naturally move to a, to a uh, cooler area as climates warm, basically have to go through some sort of urban uh, landscape or some sort of transformed landscape. This is the western boundary of Yellowstone National Park. And I'll tell you, 30 some years ago when I started working there, you couldn't, it, you couldn't tell the difference. You couldn't tell where the boundary is. Many of our western parks are actually now defined very clearly by where there has been deforestation and where there is not. This is true with many natural reserves around the world. And what it means for things like grizzly bears or birds is that they have to go across this, uh, this uh, unfamiliar and basically unprotected landscape in order to move between protected landscapes. It's also much more than climate change and, and uh, the actual habitat transformation. This is a really powerful figure that shows you what our transportation networks are like. So we see urban areas are in yellow. You can see green areas, not to scale, but all of these green lines are our roads. And then you see uh, shipping routes in blue, and you can see in white all of our air routes. And so what this means is if you put a road down, those roads are lethal for much many wildlife. And we know from studies looking at, for example, tiger movement, they will avoid roads, especially if they're traveled by, by cars with lights. And so it's, it's actually our connectivity that interrupts the connectivity of these wild animals. And then, of course, the big, the big issue is us, people. We are pretty darn abundant and we're very fertile. So if you look at this projection right here, this is the projection. If our fertility rates do not change at all, if they are exactly what they are now, our fertility rates, there is, I mean, imagine 27 billion people on the planet. So it's not possible. So what happens is you need to, you know, we need to cut the number of children uh, per couple down considerably below two. And there are all sorts of ways to do this. We can have a conversation about that if you want to. But basically, it's not just us. It's the resources we think we need. So here's another vote for you. How much of the land area on the planet has been transformed for human use? And this, this is our last question. This is land area. And by, by this I mean actually, you know, completely transforming uh, what was an intact ecosystem into something just for us. Ninety-one, seventy-one, fifty-one, and thirty-one. So the vote is seventy-one. Ready? So this map shows actually the dominance of hum This is how we've transformed. These are the ecosystems we've transformed. And I'll tell you that you'll note that a, there are large areas that haven't been transformed, but those aren't the easy to farm areas, right? Not the favorite place for people to live. 51% of the land area has been completely transformed for our use. And we've co-opted and, and basically put our fingerprint on about 83% of terrestrial land. So it's, a, it's basically more than half the planet has been transformed for our uh, use. Additionally, these people in the world, the 7 billion plus people of us on the planet, need water and food. And most people in the world, and if you note, 
the most densely populated countries in the world are China, and India soon will be the most densely populated country in the world, uh, you'll note that these areas are already under water stress. And as climates change, they will become increasingly slow. Heck, we're under water stress, and we live in California. But it's nothing compared to the kind of stress that they're in, these people are encountering. We also need new farmland. Uh, what this shows here, this is Africa. Africa is a place where the Green Revolution never hit. Everywhere else in the world, the Green Revolution really hit. The re reason, there are several reasons why it didn't. One is because there wasn't adequate supply of uh, water, and because Africa is not a single country. It's many countries. Some of them are water rich, some of them are water poor. And they're very, very uh, different. There are a lot of differences in infrastructure. But what you can see is that these areas here, the kind of the, these areas are going to decrease in production compared to what's now. And where you have to increase in production is in the central part of Africa, which turns out to be the most biodiverse part of, of Africa. These is, this is, you can't read this very well, but this is mammalian species richness, the Congo Basin, this is the Serengeti. And so what you'll find is that basically the very areas that we have are we're preserving biodiversity today just because they tend to be far removed from people and they haven't yet been transformed are the areas we need to transform for, to feed ourselves in the future. So now I'm, I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm jumping, and there are a few examples of every one of these things I've talked about in the book. But what I want to do is touch on the global migration crisis. Because before last summer, uh, we actually wrote about this in, this, in our book. And the global migration crisis is, in fact, really, ex it can easily be understood by the kinds of things that I've just mentioned to you. If you look at the top refugee producers in uh, 2015, uh, these are the countries here that are the top refugee producers. These are all regions that have experienced pretty rapid population increase in this time, 100, almost 170% uh, in Afghanistan, so rapid population. So rapid population, and that's combined with, uh, with crises in the local environment. And I wanna, what I want to do is give you an example of Syria here, the top producer of crisis, so, uh, of uh, refugees. So in Europe, there are over a million asylum applications. So that is, that's just the people that applied. Imagine the untold numbers who actually ha have been swarming Europe from every direction. They're coming, they're actually, they're coming this way, they're coming across the Mediterranean, but they're actually swinging up and riding bicycles in through Norway. They're, they're any way that they can get into Europe, they will. And it's, it's quite remarkable how many people um, have moved into Europe. That's what we hear about. But the refugee crisis throughout the, the uh, Middle East is unbelievable. In some cases, it's, it's as much as a quarter of the population in the country is now explained by Syrian refugees. So Syrian refugees, in Turkey, there are over two million refugees. So in Lebanon, uh, over a million. So the point is that these people are clearly in a crisis. They want to leave. And one of the main reasons is because between 20, 2006 and 2011, there was the worst drought in history in Syria. Over half the population was affected. They lost 85% of their livestock. People could no longer work. Um, and what that meant is that people are willing to do anything to make themselves a better life, to have some hope. So they leave. This is not something that we can manage by laws. This is something that has to be solved from within the country that's in crisis um, by thinking about the resources that they need. And I, and I pose here, which end game do we really want? This is a, a, a mock-up of a potentially new kind of building that is happening. There's actually some, uh, there's, a, there's a vacation center being built in South Africa right now like this. There is some land that's been bought uh, outside of Amsterdam. And this is a completely green system. They, the people in this community grow their own crops. There's no 
fossil fuels being used by this, and it's open space. It's a kind of place that people want to build community, and that's, of course, in contrast to what many parts of Syria look like today. So how do we dictate the fate of our planet? And it's not just our fate. We are so intrinsically linked to what happens everywhere else. It's something we need to take responsibility for. So to avoid a planetary tipping point, we have to clearly increase our energy conservation we ha and energy conversion. We have to stall habitat loss. We have to increase global cooperation. And we need to stabilize population growth. I want to underscore that the climate problem is really us. It's the top one billion. We have an unsustainable consumption of fossil fuels. We contribute 60% of climate warming greenhouse gases. The bottom three billion of the people on the planet contribute less than 5%. And in fact, they're living, in many cases, with 18th century technology, similar to what I explained to you in Nepal. They're living with, a, in some cases, a very light footprint on the land. However, locally, habitat degradation is phenomenal because they have no buffer. We have a buffer. They have no buffer. And I want to point out that the other thing that really transformed my view of the world when I went to Nepal was this place. This is uh, a hospital. This is what it looks like inside. It's brand new. And it is entirely run by solar power and micro hydro power. Do we have a hospital like that? So I, I get so inspired by going to these places because, in fact, they have figured out how to make do without going through the Industrial Revolution. They're leapfrogging based on necessity, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. In some cases, I think we have more to learn from them than they do from, from us. The other thing is I think world leaders have finally started to lead. Um, Obama has finally made a, a point. He's making, I know that, I know from people that I know in the White House, he's doing a lot behind the scenes. Trust me, he pays attention to climate and he talks about it constantly. Jerry Brown here sitting there with President G, the governor of our state, is just a rock star in my opinion. He has been incredible with dealing about climate change. He talks to world leaders around the world. He went to COP21 and managed to get 130 subnational groups together to sign on to an agreement, the under two MOU. And if you don't know what that is, go to his website, check it out. He employs and looks, works with the climate group incredible group of people. So these subnationals, 130 subnationals from around the world, these are like states, regions, so British Columbia, Oregon, Kathmandu Valley. These states and regions, these subnationals combined are the largest economy in the world. So this is a very powerful uh, set of players that he brought to COP21. Before he did that, it was basically all these presidents and premiers talking about these issues. Now, at the local scale, this regional scale, that's where we feel the effect of climate. That's where we have to adapt to climate. And this is where much of the action uh, will lie. And clearly, uh, religious leaders, not just the pope, but religious leaders of every major faith have come forward talking about this is a big issue. So the important thing is the solution is really community. It's not just some abstract thing far away or some leader far away. We've got one of the best players in the world about this right here as governor of our own state. And I'll tell you that in repeated studies, about 20% of people just care about themselves. About 20% don't really want to get involved with anything. They just go along for the ride. And the reason you do something, the reason you start these conversations, the reason you set examples is for the 60% of the planet, the 60% of us who are trying to figure out what to do and, and basically acknowledging the problem and talking to them, working together is a way to move forward. 
So I want to highlight one more thing about Governor Brown, and then I'll end on this, uh, this little plug for something that um, we happen to get involved with. This paper, this is a, the Chronicle. This paper came out, a tipping point paper came out with a, a, a several authors in 2012. And we had this, you know, above the fold uh, on the San Francisco Chronicle. And, and Jerry Brown picked this up, and he called Tony, who happened to be the lead author, author uh, he called him on the phone. And he said, you know, I don't understand what's the big deal about this paper. I don't understand this paper. Tell me why this is important. And so we started to explain to him what the deal was. And he said, why aren't you guys shouting this from the rooftops? And the point is, we scientists thought we were. But clearly, policymakers weren't hearing it for some reason. This paper also resulted in two people in France seeing an article about it published in Le Monde. And these two people, Melanie Laurent and Cyril Dion, got together. Melanie was pregnant at the time. And they said, we have to do something. And this is COP21. And I'll tell you that they produced a film about solutions, which I'll show you a little trailer for. This is the premiere. This is Melanie and Cyril. This is the premiere in Paris. And let me just show you the little trailer. If you get a chance to see it, I hope you will. A été publié il y a pas très longtemps une information qui annonce la fin possible de notre humanité. Climate change, destruction of the Earth's surface, and population growth are leading us to a tipping point. About three years ago, Siri came to me when I was pregnant and told me about this study. It said that my son would grow up in a world where food, water, and oil will be hard to find. I was running a non-profit when we met. How could we tell people about what we'd heard when they're already fed up with catastrophes? And how could we tell millions of people? We had to do something. So we traveled around the globe looking for the men and women who are offering creative alternatives. It's always so hard. We didn't start with, shall we save the planet? Because that was too grand. We just start with where we are. There is no perfect democracy or economic models, but what seemed to emerge from our journey was a new vision for the world, where each community is more autonomous, therefore more free. En faisant tout à la main sur un tout petit territoire, on peut produire autant qu'avec un tracteur sur un territoire dix fois plus grand. San Francisco has an 80% landfill diversion rate. Everything is reduced, reused, recycled, or composted. See the final show now. These people are writing a new story. They're saying it's not too late, but we have to get moving now. No. We vote, we govern. Start looking around, you will get it all the open, all the signs. There are solutions, and if we give it everything we've got, if we all join our forces and hearts, we can all start to change the world. Tomorrow. Uh, in Tottenham, we have a 21 pound note. Kind of. 21. Because you can. Why not? <laughs> So uh, this movie has yet to be um, released in the US, but it's been seen in 25 countries by over a million people. It's called Demain in French and Tomorrow in the US. It, is, um, it won the César, the French equivalent of an Oscar, uh, uh, Oscar in France. And if you're in Europe, I encourage you to, to go uh, watch it, and I'll be sure to publish, publicize it when it comes out in the US. So I want to say thanks very much for coming. And please, I, I know I'm a little bit of a Debbie Downer, but I want you to leave with the, with the optimism that really by building community and talking about these issues, um, the whole reason why this movie was produced is because we started talking about the issues. So I encourage you to do the same. So thanks for your attention.